downward ejection, a new method of escape from high-speed aircraft. The system was designed by the Wright Air Development Center to fulfill the need for a choice of escape devices. Designers can now incorporate the older upward ejection system or the new downward method in weapon systems. An extensive series of flight tests using dummies demonstrated the downward ejection system's feasibility. But important questions had to be answered before the new method could be considered proven. Would the wind blast injure a jumper's arms and legs? How well would the headrest, leg guards, tie-down strap, and trigger work? Would the automatic lap belt and parachute combination consistently function properly? At what speeds and altitudes would the new system provide adequate protection? Only human tests could answer these questions. The first series of live jumps began in October 1953. Ejections were from the nose of a B-47. The drop zone was Choctaw Hatchie Bay near Eglin Air Force Base, Florida. A water drop zone was chosen to minimize the aggravation of possible injuries incurred during test drops. Seven drops were made in this first series, all from an altitude of 10,000 feet at progressive increases in speed. The ejections are shown in slow motion. Cameras in accompanying aircraft, on rescue crash boats, and in the test plane provided photographic coverage. The downward ejection seat is similar to the upward seat in that it has the same type shoulder and belt straps and rides the same type rails. It is propelled downward at 40 feet per second, subjecting the rider to 10 negative G. This is a slightly slower speed of ejection than that exerted by the upward method. Leg guards prevent the knees from spreading during exposure to wind blast, and ankle retainer clamps keep the feet from flying upward as the seat travels down the rails. The D ring trigger, when pulled upward, fires the hatch beneath the seat and then the seat. The initiator cartridge fires the automatic lap belt after two seconds. A tie-down strap prevents body lift in ejecting. The first series of tests were to investigate performance of the seat in ejections at varying speeds. Jumps were made at indicated air speeds of 200, 260, 325, and 389 knots. All the jumps in this series were made from 10,000 feet. For economy reasons, the hatch was removed. All test jumps were made under conditions which would prevail in actual escapes. The only differences were the presence of an equipment checker who ensured desired test conditions and a recovery parachute on the seat. A B-47B was the test bed for the human drops. The jumpers were ejected from the bomber navigator position. Two chase ships equipped with high-speed cameras photographed the drops from all angles. The films were processed and screened before the next drop was made. The co-pilot touched off the ejections in all the tests so that the timing would be exact. This ensured the readiness of photographers. It also ensured the proper timing of rescue by waiting crash boats. Three hundred twenty-five knots at ten thousand feet. Two seconds after ejection, the lap belt is opened by gas pressure from a time delay cartridge. The parachute opening device was also set for two seconds. Aerodynamic drag difference between man and seat causes separation. Separation automatically arms the parachute opening device by extracting a lanyard which remains attached to the seat. The jumper can manually arm the parachute by pulling the lanyard or deploy it by pulling the ripcord. The downward ejection tests were used as a proving ground for personal clothing as well as for the seat and equipment. The Air Force partial pressure altitude suit and helmet was proved in these tests 
to be absolutely safe at speeds up to at least 389 knots. The luminous red coverall was worn to aid in photographic analysis. Immediately after pickup, test jumpers were examined by the project medical officer and interrogated. The questions asked were general in nature. It was found that if the jumper was allowed to tell, in his own words, just what he had experienced, a more personal reaction would result. Essential research data were obtained. Each of the test jumpers was an expert parachutist, having full knowledge of the kind of data required. This jump, made at 325 knots, was completely successful. In the second test jump from 10,000 feet at 200 knots, the jumper held on to the D-ring after ejection. He was not separated from the seat until the seat's recovery parachute opened and forced separation. It was later determined that all the automatic equipment functioned properly, but the jumper's grip retention held him in the seat. The jumper's retention of grip prevented his own parachute from being armed until deployment of the seat parachute pulled him away. At a low indicated airspeed, the forces which separate man and seat are relatively slight. Under actual escape conditions, there would, of course, be no parachute on the seat. In low altitude, low speed ejections, manual control should be used as soon as possible after ejection. In the first ejection at 389 knots, the jumper's hand slipped off the D-ring trigger. His arms flailed violently. His loss of grip could not be explained, and photographs were inconclusive. The test was then repeated at the same speed and under the same conditions. The second jumper lost his grip also. The jumper claimed it impossible to hold on to the D-ring at 389 knots. The leg guard loops failed with resultant knee spread. Serious leg injury was prevented by the ankle retainers withstanding the strain. Both jumpers were injured. Immediately upon entry into the airstream, their arms were whipped violently. They suffered almost identical injuries. Dislocation of an elbow, a chip fracture in the upper right arm, and arm lacerations. Attention is directed to the fact that despite the injuries sustained, both men stated that they were, at all times during the drop, capable of using their arms had manual operation been necessary. Human tests of the downward ejection system were halted at this point and work began on modifying the leg guard system and D-ring assembly in order to cure the deficiencies revealed. It was determined that the non-elasticity of the steel cable to which the D-ring is anchored, the smooth surface of the ring, and the length of the cable were trouble spots. These were the most likely causes of loss of grip when the jumper encountered the full force of the slipstream.
the leg guard system had failed at the locking pin. This is the seat as modified. The D-ring surface was roughened. The cable to which the ring is attached was lengthened and a shock absorber installed. Lock pins in the leg guards were reinforced and the shafts lengthened. Modifications to the seat completed, the second series of human downward ejection tests were conducted in July and August 1954. The continuous wear anti-exposure suit was tested. During this series of jumps, a new lightweight semi-rigid helmet, the MA-1 and the A-13A oxygen mask were worn. The jumper, in this test, as in all other tests, carefully assembles his oxygen equipment in the manner that has proved most safe. To transmit pull to the parachute, not the mask, the nylon strap at the end of the mask is wrapped around the chest strap of the parachute. The modified seat was the focus of attention. The leg guard system had been modified by lengthening the shafts leading to the discs which hold the knees in place. The locking pins were reinforced. In succeeding tests, the leg guard system proved reliable. Solution of the D-ring problem was more difficult. Months of research and test ensued. In the first seat, the position of the D-ring was such that the jumper's arms were stretched full length at the time the jumper was first exposed to the full force of the slipstream. His grip was simply not sufficient to endure the load. Static tests and dummy drops resulted in the installation of a shock absorbing device on the D-ring cable which was lengthened. Subsequent live tests proved the modified system completely tolerable to the arms. The D-ring surface was roughened to afford better grip. The second series of human tests proved the modifications functionally correct. Helmets and oxygen masks blew off approximately one second after ejection in the next three high-speed tests, 365, 395, and 410 knots. The fasteners on the chin strap were torn from the helmet and the mask was torn apart at the junction of the face piece and the hose. Loss of the equipment was painless and inflicted no injury. It is particularly noteworthy that despite the breaking of the 200 pound test chin strap, always utilized by test jumpers, only a slightly stiff neck resulted. The loss of the helmet is considered more serious than the loss of the oxygen equipment, since the helmet affords protection to the jumper in ground landings. The lack of oxygen, even in drops from high altitudes, could, at worst, cause a brief period of unconsciousness, although even this is unlikely. The fully automatic downward ejection system would deploy the parachute, thus negating any danger to the jumper. No harmful effects to the face or eyes were suffered during any of the tests. The last of the high-speed jumps was made at 423 knots indicated airspeed from 10,000 feet. The wind blast did not cause a loss of grip on the D-ring. The automatic system functioned. The exposure suit was not damaged. No oxygen was used, although the complete assembly was carried. For this test, the directional snap fasteners had been removed from the oxygen mask and replaced by two screw fittings. The wind blast encountered in ejection at this speed stretched the hose on the oxygen mask out behind the seat and then wrapped it around the jumper's neck. The exhalation valve was lost and the mask turned inside out although it stayed in place on the jumper's face. The connection to the bailout bottle remained intact and the helmet stayed on, but the mask was, of course, useless.
The jumper described the experience as confusing but painless. The drop zone for the two high altitude test jumps was changed to a radar reflecting target 7,000 yards offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. The drop points were determined by ground radar installations on the beach. These final jumps were made from 45,200 feet at 218 knots. The first jumper wore a P3 helmet and visor. He fell for 120 seconds before his chute opened. He spun violently, more than 90 revolutions per minute for seconds, but was able to do every necessary task before landing in the water. During the remainder of the day, he experienced moderate attacks of vertigo, but no other complaints or new findings resulted. A red flare marks the location of the jumper in the second high altitude test. He wore a lightweight leather helmet without a visor. There were no ill effects or loss of vision. He fell 130 seconds before his parachute deployed at 11,000 feet. He found that he could arrest spin by flailing his arms and legs wildly. The test bed aircraft was depressurized two minutes before ejection. The jumpers armed their bailout bottles one minute before ejection. Stopwatches started at minus 15 seconds and the hatch jettisoned at minus 10. No special equipment or apparel was used in any of the 17 human downward ejection tests. Conditions were kept as near those of an escape ejection as possible. The downward ejection tests prove that automatic ejection equipment is a must for high-speed, high-altitude aircraft. It was also demonstrated that the downward ejection system in its present form provides safe egress at speeds up to at least 425 knots indicated airspeed and up to altitudes of at least 45,200 feet.